Well, good morning. It appears that we are now live. Um, this is the first time we've tried uh, uh, a virtual town hall meeting like this. My name is Joe Atkins. I am uh, Dakota County Commissioner. I'm joined this morning uh, by Representative Angie Craig, Dakota County Board Chair Mike Slavik, uh, and Christine Lees, who's handling uh, emergency preparedness and is a public health supervisor with Dakota County. Uh, and I'll turn down the volume on my phone so that I won't have the feedback. Thank you all for joining us this morning uh, for this important uh, visit about COVID-19, as well as other topics that you wish to visit about. I uh, would uh, ask that you please join us as we kick off our meeting with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Again, thank you everyone for joining us. You're, you're welcome to send in your questions. We're gonna kick off uh, by hearing from Congresswoman Craig. Uh, then we'll turn it to uh, Board Chair Slavic and we'll get a public health update uh, from Christine Lees following that, as well as him having a, uh, a Q&A. Um, Congresswoman Craig, let me start by saying uh, you have been the most accessible person I've ever encountered in my life. Uh, I don't know how many town meetings you've uh, you've had now, but on behalf of local officials and residents, uh, thank you so much for your accessibility. It's been uh, been great having you represent us and being uh, so often in touch with what's going on. With that, I'm going to turn it to you to give us a uh, an update on where things are at federally with respect to COVID-19. Thank you, thank you so much, Joe. Really appreciate it, and thank you so much to uh, Dakota County Chairman Mike Slavic to you, Joe, and to County uh, Public Health Supervisor Christine Lees for this opportunity to come together this morning to virtually talk with residents uh, throughout Dakota County and the second congressional district. I wanna say thank you to everyone tuning in from home this morning. In my first term in office, I have held 14 town halls in person. I look forward to them and I especially look forward to the day when we can all get together in person again. Dakota County is the largest county in the second congressional district. It's where the majority of the COVID-19 uh, cases have been confirmed so far, but the public health issues we're going to discuss today impact all of our cities, our counties, uh, our state, and our country. Right now, many Minnesotans are facing concern and uncertainty as schools close, workers are laid off, demands on businesses change and our nonprofits are overextended. Especially in these difficult times, we all have a part to play to keep ourselves, our families and our neighbors safe. Social distancing may be a big change in our day-to-day -day lives, but it's one of the most practical ways in which we can flatten the curve of COVID-19. Please take the recommendations from the CDC and the Minnesota Department of Health very seriously. So far, Congress has passed two bipartisan bills to address the impacts of COVID-19. The most important thing to remember as we discuss these issues today is that this is first and foremost about public health. We must lead with that in mind. Two weeks ago, the United States House of Representatives passed the first of what will ultimately be many measures that we're going to need to put in place to deal with this public health crisis. The Coronavirus Preparedness and Response Supplemental Appropriations Act of 2020 provided for more than $3 billion for research of vaccines and our support of our healthcare community. More than $2.2 billion in prevention, preparedness, and response measures, including $950 million for state and local health agencies, extension of telemedicine services and low interest loans to small businesses, which I'll say a lot more about throughout the course of this morning. Early last Saturday morning, the House also passed the Families First Coronavirus Response Act on a bipartisan basis, and the president has now signed this into law as well. The bill allows for free testing for the coronavirus for all individuals including the uninsured. There are serious capacity issues with testing right now, which we will come back to, I'm sure, in our Q&A. Paid emergency leave for millions of workers 
with two weeks of paid sick leave and up to three months of paid family and medical leave, a step that we hope will help some of the furloughed workers that we've seen this need this week. But I assure you more is going to be needed. We strengthen food security and we also increase funds for Medicaid. Since last weekend, I have participated in numerous conference calls and calls with the small business community as we develop further ideas to stimulate the economy and help address these issues. Over the last two weeks, I've met multiple times with the entire Minnesota delegation, Governor Tim Walls and Minnesota Hospital Association members via conference call. Our county health leaders met to update me on their progress before social distancing measures were put in place. And our school communities came together on a conference call to talk about the preparedness for distance learning throughout our community. We also brought together the nonprofit communities. I'm committed to making sure that in any stimulus or small business package that our nonprofits are also considered. As the Star Tribune said in an editorial this week, medical and economic recovery hinges on a terrible conundrum. The very measures needed to stop the spread of the disease also inflict immediate and massive damage to the economy, along with the livelihoods of millions. First, to those of you who have been laid off this week, making sure that those hard working impacted Minnesotans can get through this and that you have a place to come back to work when this public health crisis is over is my number one priority. I'm squarely focused on making sure our small businesses can survive and our middle class is supported in any further legislative action we take. We must learn the lessons of the last recession and stimulus. We cannot allow large companies to take taxpayer dollars and then give stock options to their executives and buy back stock, including there must be strings attached in any package that we come up with including keeping as many people on the payroll as long as possible. Small businesses who don't have lo lobbyists in Washington must, must have a voice, and I intend to be that voice. We must do everything we can to limit the spread and flatten the curve. That's why we need to ensure paid sick leave and help Minnesota refill its unemployment coffers as quickly as possible. This is the only way we give our emergency responders and healthcare providers a fighting chance to take care of the most ill. It is imperative if you can that you stay home. We can't let perfect be the enemy of good. There will be things in future stimulus packages that you and I both will not like, but we must work together and get it done. In Minnesota, the delegation is united that we must act quickly and we hope to be back in Washington as early as this coming week to vote on the next bill in the United States House of Representatives. Finally, I want to end my formal remarks by thanking Minnesota's doctors, nurses, first responders who are on the front line of this pandemic. I am fighting hard to get additional personal protective equipment to you from the nation's strategic reserves as quickly as possible. I know you are risking your own health and you need better from your nation. I want to thank the teachers, the nonprofits, still helping those in need during this very difficult time. The grocery store workers, the sanitation workers, the child care providers, and everyone else who gets up every single day to help us get through this medical emergency. Thank you to the Minnesotans who are staying home to help keep all of us safe. I want to be crystal clear with my constituents. This is going to be a difficult time as a state and as a nation, but I have no doubt that as Minnesotans, we will be there for each other because as Minnesotans, we are stronger and we are always there for our neighbors. We are resilient, we are strong, and we will get through this together. So thank you so much for joining us this morning. And Joe, Mike, Christine, thank you so much for holding this forum with me.
Uh, thank you very much, Congresswoman Craig. Uh, we very much on behalf of Dakota County do appreciate the fact that you uh, included us in part of your town hall today. Uh, a couple of things, you know, our first and uh, number one priority is the health and safety of all residents of Dakota County and our over 2,000 employees. Uh, right now, two thirds of our employees are working from home and being able to do other ways of doing business. Uh, as of Wednesday morning, um, all public facing uh, services were, uh, uh, we were able to shut them down. Right now, the, the library locations have been closed. Our service centers uh, were, were closed. Our license centers were closed. Park facilities were closed as of Wednesday because it's uh, first and foremost to make sure that we have uh, the residents to uh, be able to stay home, as you said just moments ago. Um, with that, that certainly means that how we do business as the counties go and provide services for much of uh, the area, uh, we have to go and do things differently. With two thirds of our employees now working from home, uh, we've had to figure out how, what are the best ways to be able to do the services that still need to go on. Uh, with that, one of the things is um, an example of that via mail right now. So for licenses that you need to go and go through, typically you would go to one of our service counters to the license centers, and now we will go to the, uh, uh, you can still submit that through mail. We have staff who are able to work uh, distance either from home or from uh, county offices that are closed to the public and able to get those uh, processes still done. Another example that we've been able to do is our library. Our librarians are doing story time, widely popular and uh, the story time now on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays at 9 a.m. via Facebook Live are able to go in and have our librarians read the stories to, uh, to be part of it. So that has been a, a great, uh, great opportunity with that. Um, and then lastly, we do have a, um, the opportunity, our phone lines are still working. So we're able to still be available for, um, to be able to connect with the residents when there's issues uh, that go with that. Our parks and trails are still open. Though the uh, facilities are closed, uh, we still have made it that uh, with appropriate social distancing, getting some fresh air and experiencing our over 5,000 acres of parks is still very valuable to uh, be able to do at this moment. So we are still encouraging people to, to get the fresh air, but certainly keep your distance from uh, various people in there. And then uh, we've added some additional capacity with our library with the ebook services. So now is a great time to go and read a book and we, uh, uh, want to make sure that we have those opportunities available. And what I can say at this point is that this is not just, this is just where we've been able to be in a very unprecedented time right now. Staff and, and uh, the elected officials, we're trying to figure out ways to be able to provide services in a different way than what we currently are offering. So uh, I, I would really encourage you to stay tuned. Uh, go on our Dakota County website at dakotacounty.us to be able to see what might be done differently. We've uh, seen other counties that have gone and expanded Wi-Fi in their parking lots of uh, the libraries so that there's some uh, better broadband and internet service to uh, partnering with our uh, um, uh, with the libraries to look at possibly a, a drop-off location to get books. So we're still evolving on what services may look like, and but our first and foremost is to be able to provide those services to the same ability that we uh, best ability that we've been able to do in the past. So I will once again encourage anyone uh, to continue to use our website at dakotacounty.us uh, for more information. Thanks so much, Mike, and thanks, Angie. Appreciate the uh, both the federal update and the update on where things are at uh, with respect to Dakota County services. Uh, we're now going to turn to Christine Lees, uh, who is heading up emergency preparedness on behalf of Dakota County. She's a public health supervisor. Christine, let me echo what uh, uh, what uh, Congresswoman Craig and, and Chair Slavic said. Thank you so much for the efforts that you and your team have been making, uh, along with everybody else who's on the front lines. Uh, if you could, um, can you kind of walk uh, walk folks, walk, walk the viewers through what uh, what you're working on? What are the most common things that you're hearing about? What's the most important thing that there are things that people ought to know right now? Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you to Commissioner Atkins and Commissioner Slava, Congresswoman Craig, for inviting me to talk with you all today about this very critical issue that's impacting the daily lives of all of us here in our community. I would like to start with talking about what we are doing in public health to address the spread of COVID here in Dakota County. First, I just wanna let everyone know that we have an incredibly dedicated and hardworking, very competent public health department here in Dakota County. All of our employees, when they are hired, go through emergency response training 
And we regularly conduct trainings and exercises throughout the year to prepare our staff to rapidly respond to situations just like this. Our public health department is currently responding with an all hands on deck approach. We have nurses who normally work in other areas of our department that are taking on new roles to answer questions that are coming through our public health call lines about COVID-19. Our supervisors and program coordinators throughout the department are working on coordinating community resource needs for some of our most vulnerable populations in Dakota County. Myself and my disease prevention control and emergency preparedness staff are working tirelessly to provide guidance on risk to people that are exposed, coordinating case investigation and response activities with the Minnesota Department of Health. Public Health continues to do con conducting case investigations when there is a positive case in our community. We work to identify other people that may be at risk and notify them. However, it is important to note that we have had cases in Minnesota where we are unable to identify a known risk factor or connection with another person who is sick. That is how we know that there is community transmission and spread happening within our community. And it is because of this that one of our primary goals in our current public health response is to slow down the spread of the virus in our community. We need to flatten this curve to make sure that our healthcare system is not stretched beyond capacity to respond, particularly in caring for those who are very sick that may need ICU uh, bed treatment, including ventilator support. It's through spreading, it's through slowing down the spread of this virus and flattening this curve that we can prevent this from happening. To stop the spread of COVID-19, the next graphic showing the concept that we talk about a lot of social distancing. Unlike other infectious diseases, we do not have a vaccine or a known effective treatment at this time. There are several medications that are currently undergoing trials globally, but we do not know their effectiveness yet. And we do not have herd immunity to this virus. We know that we have COVID-19 cases circulating and this is why social distancing is so important. And this is why Governor Waltz and Commissioner Malcolm are leading our state through these measures to stop the spread of the virus. Social distancing is our most effective tool to do this. We know the virus is primarily spreading through droplets in the air that come when someone is sick and they're coughing or sneezing. However, we also know it is possible for people to spread the virus and they have minimal to no symptoms. And this is why we are asking for everyone to practice social distancing, even if you are feeling well. The next slide gives an update on some of the top five um, practices that you can take at home to protect our community. In addition to social distancing, we have other measures that we do know will help prevent the spread of this virus. It is absolutely critical to stay home when you are sick. It's when you are sick and you have symptoms of illness that you are most likely to transmit the virus to other people. Good hand washing with soap and water is the most effective way to protect yourself from exposures in the community. Hand washing needs to have a constant uh, water running with friction, mild friction with soap and thoroughly rinsing your hands afterwards. And this practice of good hand washing technique is very effective at preventing the spread of the virus. Next, I wanna talk about how important it is to stay informed. This situation is changing daily and we are learning more about COVID-19 every day. We are working very diligently to provide this information to you so we know what the situation is here in Minnesota. This virus is spreading in different ways and in different rates across the United States and across the globe. And knowing the situation locally is important to understa understand the steps you can take to keep you and your loved ones healthy. There are several hotlines available to you, 
And we as a community need to make sure that we are seeking information from sources that can provide accurate and effective advice. The Minnesota Department of Health has opened several hotlines. You can call these numbers with questions directed about your health, as well as there's a specific line for school and childcare questions. Dakota County Public Health is also going to be opening a public hotline this Tuesday. We will be sending that information with the number through all of our media channels, including posting it on our website and on our social media platforms. The Dakota County homepage also has a message about COVID-19 at the top. And if you click on that, it will take you to our website that will give you more information about what Dakota County is doing for our response locally. And it will also direct you to Minnesota Department of Health and the CDC for the most updated uh, situation updates. I would just like to take a moment to thank all of you for helping us in public health mitigate the effect of this virus on our community by following these orders and doing all that you can to keep our community safe. We each have a role to play and it is very important to do this to protect especially the most vulnerable in our community. And I would be happy to stop at this time and help respond to some of the questions that you might have. Christine, thank you, and thank you again to your to your team for all that you're doing um, with respect to us. All sorts of questions are rolling in, and I'm gonna the first uh, first couple I'm gonna um, send uh, send your way, and then uh, Congresswoman Craig uh, as well. But Christine, the uh, the question is, and this might be for Congresswoman Craig. A lot of questions about testing and the lack of tests, and when will there be more tests, and when will we catch up with the rest of the world? Uh, with the tests. Um, do you have a sense of that? And then we're going to turn to Congresswoman Craig uh, next to see what uh, where things are at federally with regard to testing. Sure, I can start with just talking about where we're at right now. So we do have the capacity to test for COVID-19 here in Minnesota. Um, the public health laboratory has the testing capabilities and several of our private labs are also developing it. The issue has been a shortage of some of the specific reagents that are needed for this test. And I can tell you that there is a great amount of work right now to try and catch up to the testing needs that we have. Um, what the uh, health department has done right now in Minnesota is asked that people only go in for testing if they are requiring a higher level of care such as hospitalizations. We also want to make sure that we can test our healthcare workers. Since they're on the front lines, we really want to make sure we're still providing tests for them. And the third group of people that are still being recommended for testing are those that are living in high risk congregate settings. So our assisted livings, our nursing homes, our group homes. Um, we still would like to make sure we're testing those individuals till our supply catches up with the demand. Thanks, Christina. We're going to turn to Congresswoman Craig with the a similar kind of question, and I'm going to throw two questions at you at once, Congresswoman. The, the first is about tests uh, and the availability of tests and what the federal government is doing with respect to that. And then we're getting a lot about small business uh, impacts and the, and the impact that folks uh, who own small businesses, work at small businesses are going to have. Can you speak to those two issues for us? Yeah, let me just start with the test. This has been an ongoing topic for about the last week and a half with the federal government. Uh, you know, I had the opportunity uh, to meet with uh, the vice president and the White House task force last, uh, I guess it was a week ago, Thursday morning now. And we saw this coming. Uh, we knew the state uh, of Minnesota was going to be capacity constrained because of the supply chain issues with the reagent. And, you know, what I think um, is most important in this situation is that we're honest with excuse me, the American people were honest with Minnesotans that if you uh, do not meet the specific criteria as outlined by Christine, you will likely at this point not be able uh, to get a COVID-19 test. Um, exactly as she said, the issue is um, supply chain uh, related to the reagent needed uh, for the government test. Now we see private companies left and right are standing up to be able to step in and um, fill this gap, but it really has been problematic because it's put us uh, behind being able to look at community spread. And I'll end the testing just by saying 
Um, we have a similar issue uh, with availability of personal protective equipment for the nation's healthcare workers. And I, I have been uh, actively encouraging the delegation to work with the White House Task Force uh, to release uh, the strategic supply uh, to, to Minnesotans for healthcare workers um, and to, um, uh, to, to implement the Defense Production Act. I think that's where we're gonna be as we look at what's next. Um, we need uh, every manufacturing company in this country uh, coming to the aid of their country right now to be able to produce the supplies that we need. And then, Joe, uh, as you, uh, the second question was, uh, was about the small businesses. You know, the key here uh, to the economy is helping individuals who've lost their job survive here for the next little bit so that they have a job to come back to um, when this is all said and done. So I've been particularly focused on making sure uh, that we uh, have a, a, a way for small businesses to stay in business uh, in order to have those jobs to come back to. And I'm on the small business um, committee, uh, the House Committee on Small Business. And so last night, something important happened. Uh, the SBA Economic Injury Disaster Loan Declaration was accepted by the federal government. Uh, my team and I put out notices to the business community uh, late last evening around uh, 815 to let them know that that is happening. You can go to uh, my website at craig.house.gov uh, and you can see some of those resources. Uh, but uh, this will allow small businesses to take out loans uh, at a very low interest uh, in order to survive this uh, partic particular difficult period of time. The other thing that uh, I'm doing and then I'll close out here is uh, I'm working on legislation that I'm trying to get into the next stimulus package that would establish a temporary guaranteed loan program administered by SBA approved banks. So a lot of banks here in our local communities, um, they are uh, approved to do SBA loans. We need to get as many of these small business loans um, being worked in our own communities as possible. The disaster assistance is a federal program that's administered at the federal government level. And I want us to be able to have folks to walk into many of our community banks and our credit unions and secure those small business loans here locally. So I'm working with the House Committee on Small Business to try to get that included in the next stimulus package. And just to follow up, Congresswoman, uh, you mentioned small business loans. Is there one of the questions we had was whether or not there might be out, outright grants um, as part of an aid package or emergency relief of some sort that's not just loans? Yeah, that, that that's certainly that's uh, something that's on the table at the moment. I think you're going to see that uh, in the next uh, stimulus package as a potential. Um, but this was the mechanism we have in place, an existing program for economic injury um, due to a disaster sure. that we could stand up as quickly as possible. And so, um, you know, the the topic of grants versus uh, loans is something that we're going to be working through. Uh, in a negotiated bill with the White House over the course of the next few days. Very good. Um, and I'm just going to throw a number of questions at you, rapid fire. Uh, will Social Security payments continue through the pandemic? Yes. My understanding is that they will continue through the pandemic. Um, you know, that's that's the thing. I mean, when we talk about social distancing um, to flatten the curve and give our healthcare community a fighting chance with the number of folks who need medical equipment like ventilators. All of this, uh, you know, the, the continuity of services at the federal government, we're gonna be working hard to keep all of those things consistent. Um, it, it's really the overwhelming of the healthcare system that we're putting many of these things in place for. Very good. Um, the question, uh, will an aid package perhaps uh, for displaced workers also include coverage for health insurance costs? Well, we're, you know, the, the goal is in the aid package to keep as many people on the payroll for businesses as possible with their benefits. That, that will be uh, the thing that we'll be trying to do is to keep people on payrolls and their benefits secure. Um, there are many people uh, who uh, didn't have access to health insurance when this pandemic started. So the other thing we've done in one of the congressional packages is ensure that uh, you can uh, have access to uh, treatment and testing for coronavirus uh, 
uh, even for the uninsured. Uh, so we'll be working uh, with small businesses. What uh, many of the businesses in the private sector that I've talked to over the course of the last few days have been laying off their workers so that they can get access uh, to uh, uh, unemployment insurance, but have been leaving uh, their health care intact. So I think it's going to vary dramatically, uh, but certainly one of the things we're going to be looking at in these stimulus packages is how can we keep people as whole as possible while we work to keep businesses in business so that when we come out of the other side of this, people have their jobs. Right. So true. Um, and I'm going to turn to uh, Christine Lees next. Um, thank you, Congresswoman. The, uh, uh, there's all sorts of questions coming in. One of the um, one of the questions, Christine, uh, that we heard is uh, personal safety equipment. People are concerned, can they get it? How should they use it? Um, who should have priority for it? Can you speak to that for us? Yeah, absolutely. So it's really important to make sure that first of all, we have enough personal protective equipment um, for our first responders and our um, healthcare workers. Um, so there's a couple of different types of um, protective gear that they need in particular. And one of them that we talk a lot about are a specific type of face mask known as a respirator or an N95. And these are um, absolutely critical for our healthcare workers to prevent them from getting it, as well as for our first responders. So our police, fire, EMS that are out in the community. And I can tell you that in public health, we are working um, very closely with our cities and our first responders uh, we're having weekly check-in calls now with them, and we're doing a daily assessment of the PPE that they have for their first responders, and we're compiling that data and sending it up to the state level to make sure that we're requesting for our local community the amount of protective gear that we need for our first responders. And as Angie mentioned, the uh, Strategic National Stockpile has been asked to supply additional protective gear that will be specifically for our healthcare system. For individuals at home, again, going back, the most important thing really is hand washing, covering your cough and staying home. The type of respirators that healthcare workers use, um, you have to have special fit testing to make sure that they fit and are uh, effective. The surgical masks that people are going out and buying, they don't protect you from getting it. They are just helping to limit the amount of spread that you have when you are coughing and sneezing. Thank you, Christine. Um, Commissioner Slavik, uh, we'll turn to you next. We've got a, a question about whether or not um, property taxes, business property taxes for small businesses that might be suffering could be delayed well, uh, without penalty. Well, Currently, if they pay late, obviously there's some interest and penalty that comes with that. Uh, that's I don't know if that's something that the uh, uh, has been discussed in other counties. What's your thoughts? Well, uh, I've had the opportunity to have some conversations with, with the other Metro board chairs, and, and this is something in generally that uh, um, property taxes, not just for businesses, but for all residents have have kind of come up in conversations. And, and we've had some opportunities to just have discussion with our um, with our delegation and with the other state uh, senators and state representatives. And, and I guess we, we kind of are looking towards our, uh, our state partners in, with this because um, I don't think it will be a county by county, but more of a uh, kind of something coming from the state legislature where we would see this, um, that I think we're, we're going in there. As most people know, property taxes pays for a lot of our schools, our, our police, our fire with our cities, our counties, and as well as the, the state dollars. And, and uh, I don't think that it's, it's really something that the counties individually can do as 87 counties or a thousand cities or a thousand townships. But um, I do know that there have been conversations with our uh, state legislators and senators to see what may be happening based on that. And Mike, a follow up for you. Um, I know as board chair, you have been going nearly round the clock, uh, not only just here at the county, but talking with your colleagues, other board chairs, other commissioners in other counties. Uh, do you have a sense of what their experience is versus what we're having here? Number of cases, uh, response, uh, are they setting up hotlines like, to, like Dakota County is? Can you give uh, viewers a sense of where we stand relative to other, our partner counties? I think particularly in the metro area, we're really, um, we're, we're coming, coalescing fairly quickly, kind of a, with a one voice and one uh, similar pattern. I know that not only are the board chairs uh, having regular conversations, but also the county administrators and county managers for the seven county metro area realizing 
uh, with such a large population that that's uh, going that way. But uh, so I would say that we're getting very similar. Some are moving a little faster than others and, and that, but uh, even as you've seen some of our, our neighboring counties outside of uh, the seven county metro area, they're very much modeling what the uh, metro counties are doing. So I think that um, uh, though maybe the pace hasn't been the exact same, we, we're, we're getting to be on the same uh, page uh, within the matter of days. Okay. And, uh, and Mike, you were among the, as, as board chair, you were among the first to declare a state of emergency, um, one of the first counties in, uh, in Minnesota. What was the, the point of the, of the declaration of a state of emergency? Well, th uh, thank you, Commissioner Atkins. You know, uh, Dakota County was just in a weird schedule with our board meetings that we had a long period of time uh, where we were not going to meet as a board. In fact, our uh, next regularly scheduled board meeting is this uh, coming Tuesday, March 24th. And with that, we wanted to make sure that we, um, uh, at that point, we were going to declare a state of emergency as our full board meeting on Tuesday, but things were moving far faster than they needed to be. And uh, whereas some of our, our peer counties able, were able to have board meetings uh, this week, they were able to move um, uh, forgiveness on, on that. Um, so that, that was one of the aspects on there. Um, uh, uh, so that's kind of kind of where it happened. So by declaring a state of emergency on Tuesday, we were also able to declare a special meeting of the board on um, uh, on Friday yesterday. So for the very first time in history, Dakota County Board met remotely and electronically, and actually had almost a two-hour meeting where, amongst things, we actually ratified the state of emergency, but also went and um, uh, also went and did a. Uh, um, uh, we actually had an update from all of our division directors to say what is happening on a on a on a uh, county level with the response to the, uh, so far. Okay. There's also there's a thank you here, Mike, uh, from uh, from folks about uh, there being a list of small businesses and restaurants that are still open. I know Dakota County GIS and some of the cities have been working together to make available where. Uh, by the way, we're gonna we're gonna turn to Congresswoman Craig now with a couple of questions, but. Uh, uh, the uh, the appreciation is out there from businesses and uh, and consumers about uh, that list of businesses and and uh, restaurants that are are still open um, that'll be available that is available online. Uh, Congresswoman, the uh, um, so the uh, the uh, stimulus package, the economic package. I uh, got a question about uh, checks um, and a thousand dollar check or a twelve hundred dollar check. What's the status of that? Can people expect a check in their mailbox in the next couple of weeks? Well, I, I'm expecting that leadership from both sides of the aisle are uh, uh, appropriately social distance, but on the phone right as we speak here today, working out exactly how we're going to address these issues. And as, as I said before, um, I think you're going to see a number of different proposals, uh, especially for uh, low income earners, for folks who are just trying to pay the rent uh, here in the next uh, several days. And, uh, you know, I would expect there to be some level uh, that include is included in that final stimulus package. I also think, you know, as you think about someone being uh, laid off, uh, 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 that we need to have a huge infusion uh, into the state's unemployment insurance. Keep in mind the state of Minnesota, um, I was on the phone with uh, Deed Commissioner Steve Grove here a couple days ago. You know, we're gonna exhaust uh, the uh, unemployment insurance uh, fund here very, very quickly. Um, if Minnesota has, you know, an unemployment rate, let's uh, just say at 10 percent, it's going to be exhausted very, very quickly. And so the federal government uh, needs to have a cash infusion into that so that we can keep those folks uh, at least partially uh, whole and make sure that they can uh, survive until we get businesses back up and running. So, you know, it's it's uh, we're um, we're trying to be as thoughtful as we can on uh, how we do everything possible to keep uh, people living month to month. And at the same time, uh, how do we keep businesses in business so that there's a job to come back to? Right, right. Um, getting a lot of questions about schools, school equipment, school operations. I know you had a, speaking of town meetings, I don't know how many you've had now, um, <laughs> uh, many, many just this week alone. Uh, in addition over the past several months, but you had one with respect to school or with school leaders earlier this week. Can you kind of right. uh, let viewers know what uh, what happened there? Yeah, so I, you know, two things. I wanted the community to be able to to know what the process our school leaders are going through to get distance learning up uh, up and going. Um, you know, Minnesota is better prepared than many states uh, to deal with distance learning. 
from the perspective of, you know, when it's 40 below, uh, where my 17 year old, uh, almost 17 year old goes to school, um, you know, distance learning uh, methodologies are already in place, access to technology is already in place. So for a number of schools in our community, grades six through 12 anyway, we already have a little bit of the infrastructure in place uh, to deal with this. Now, I, I don't want to uh, uh, deny that there are parts of this congressional district that uh, don't have good access to high speed internet, to broadband. Uh, and so this public health crisis is really exposing uh, the fact that in rural America today, uh, access to high speed internet ought to be as common as, as having a mailbox. And as we look at um, a stimulus package over the course, uh, you know, this one I'm talking about, the third one that I believe we'll end up voting on hopefully next week, it won't be the last. And my own view is that uh, we need to make sure that broadband uh, and making sure that we have access for distance learning, for telehealth, um, this uh, situation is really exposing our lack of infrastructure investment in rural areas. And this is a very high priority for me as we think about this stimulus. So, you know, to all those teachers who are out there, um, there were really two things I wanted. One, to help our community better understand what our superintendents are going through, our teachers are going through as we prepare for distance learning, um, but also to raise public policy issues that come up as we prepare to do this. Uh, in the first bill, uh, we expanded SNAP benefits for those students, the 22 million children across America who are on free and reduced lunch, who um, if you're not in a school setting, often uh, don't have access uh, to food security. So there are many, many issues that came up in the school preparedness conversation. Uh, some were just, uh, you know, let's make sure our community knows what's happening. Uh, and then others were at a policy level, we have to accelerate our investment in broadband in uh, rural America. Uh, and we also have to make sure that the federal government is stepping up uh, to fulfill its obligations, even through distance learning. One of the things that I'm working on is, uh, you know, how do we step up the federal government's investment in IDEA, um, the Individual uh, Disabilities Education Act, which is one of the most underfunded part uh, parts of our school community when it comes to a federal response. So Joe, just uh, lots of things happening and just a shout out to all those teachers uh, in our communities who have really stepped up to the challenge here. Um, and you know, to all those parents uh, who uh, suddenly are trying to work from home uh, and have uh, young children running around. Uh, you know, I mean, this is, uh, this is uh, interesting times and it takes, uh, uh, really a, a change on all of our parts. Well, if there was ever a time that we've come to appreciate teachers, I think it's happening right now. Um, I, I, and uh, Congressman, I'm gonna come back to you with a question. I did wanna give a shout out to uh, the kitchen workers, the transportation folks uh, who are out there delivering meals. Um, they're they're at, uh, at schools where kids, no questions asked. Um, they're able to uh, provide meals, all the restaurants uh, that are doing the same providing school lunches. It's uh, it's great to see people coming together to, to do that. I heard a story yesterday about the kitchen workers and transportation workers in Invergrove Heights who literally had the option of being off for spring break um, and opted to uh, to give up their spring break to deliver meals. So that's the kind of the kind of thing that we're starting to see. It's just great to great to see people stepping yeah, up. That's exactly award, what's great about yeah. Minnesota, Joe. Isn't it? I mean, that's the amazing thing about our community is when we have these issues, people step up and, you know, uh, I'll let you ask your second question, but just a shout out to all those nonprofits who are finding a way uh, with increased demand uh, to continue to serve our community. And just, you know, a little bit of a caveat. I had a call with them uh, a couple of days ago as well. And uh, most of those volunteers are uh, older, more vulnerable Minnesotans. So if you're young and you're healthy and uh, you can help fill some uh, grocery bags for drive up uh, food security, food banks, that sort of thing, think about uh, ways you can serve your community right now. That's a great message and thank you. I'm going to, I'm giving a warning to, uh, to Chair Slavic that I'm going to come and talk to him about broadband, but keep, stay there, Congresswoman Craig. I know that uh, the tech folks that are operating this, I don't want you to go away because one of the, one of the questions I got was also about Minnesota companies, the St. Jude's, the 3M's, the Mayo's, uh, what are they doing? And have you been in touch with them, um, your staff been in touch with them about the efforts that they're making to step up and, uh, and help with this crisis? 
Absolutely. Uh, so uh, I started two and a half weeks ago on a Saturday with a call with 3M uh, and just understanding what their capacity was going to be. Should we need to uh, ramp up production in the United States of the N95 mask? So, you know, 3M is doing everything, I believe, in their power to ramp up production. Uh, you know, the you know, I think there'll there'll be a time and a place uh, to come back to whether we were fully prepared as a federal government to respond, um, you know, with the appropriate level of stockpiles of equipment like these protected masks. I suspect the answer will be uh, that we weren't. Uh, but our local companies are just um, really stepping up uh, to make sure that they are part of uh, the solution here in this national crisis. You know, I'll shout out to uh, Medtronic. I think they're They've got some ventilator um, capacity, uh, respirator, excuse me, respirator capacity that they're stepping up, um, you know, and, and all hands on deck. I mean, to me, we, we are all in this together. And I'm absolutely certain with the Defense Production Act that our local communities would shift manufacturing from non-essential goods um, to the goods that we are going to need in the healthcare community. And I you know, I would just encourage uh, the federal government, the administration to move quickly, quickly, quickly. I think that's, uh, you know, that's the, the message here is we need to move fast because, um, you know, the we all know. Uh, I had a call yesterday with the Minnesota Hospital Association with my colleagues in Congress across the aisle. We're doing this routinely so that we can get a good sense of uh, what the greatest needs are. And, um, you know, the number of sick uh, showing up at our hospitals is uh, bound to increase here in the coming days and weeks. Uh, and we just need to do everything we can to put our healthcare workers in a position to uh, to help deal with this. Thank you. And before we turn to Commissioner Slavic, I wanted to, um, you've, uh, the, the Humble Act uh, that you've sponsored, how would that impact legislators' ability to sell stocks for profit uh, based on information that they, that they receive? There seem to be a number of questions that are arising about uh, about Congress people having information ahead of time and being able to trade stocks. Can you speak to that quick? Well, let me just say, I introduced this bill in June of 2019. So this was very soon after I was sworn in. And the reason I did it is because I worked at a Fortune 500 publicly traded company for a number of years. And I sat in board meetings and um, on the leadership team. And I can tell you, you know, there is no way I believe members of Congress should be allowed to own individual stocks. And I was a little bit astounded that we are allowed to own individual stocks. I don't hold any. I've said uh, from the start, even before I was running for Congress uh, or while I was running for Congress that um, I don't think we should do it. So I introduced the Humble Act in 2019. It does a number of things, but in section five, it prohibits individual stock ownership by members of Congress. I also introduced an amendment um, a resolution in uh, a bill called HR1 last year that passed its sweeping uh, campaign finance and government reform that would prohibit members of Congress so, from serving on company boards. If you can believe it, members of Congress today are not prohibited from serving on company boards. And then going back to the Humble Act, uh, it also would prevent members of Congress after they serve their communities from ever being able to register as a lobbyist. I will tell you um, that, you know, I once, since I've been a member, had a former member of Congress, because I had turned down his meeting with a client, come to the House floor to try to get me to come outside and meet with his client. And so, you know, this is what everybody hates about government when you see these examples of uh, folks not doing the right thing. So, Look, I don't know the individual circumstances for the stock sales that occurred over the last couple of months uh, by my colleagues. Um, it's legal, let me put it that way, uh, for a member of Congress to do it. I'm sure that uh, in those instances, uh, they could be referred to the, at least in the House, the House Ethics Committee, Committee, the Senate Ethics Committee, to do a thorough investigation. But the point I'm making to you, Joe, is it should not be allowed in the first place. Thank you. I uh, hear, hear, by the way. I, I, uh, I'd i like to turn to Commissioner Slavic. Uh, we've had lots of comments now, Mike, about uh, broadband, uh, lack of broadband, um, distance learning. What are we, uh, how, are, how are folks going to go about that? 
I know that broadband has been a topic that you have uh, been concerned about and sharing with us for some time. Do you want to talk about where broadband is in Dakota County? Well, sure. I think that uh, one of the things that, that what we're dealing with right now certainly is showing is that broadband is true. It, good internet speed is certainly um, becoming a utility that's an essential part of life. We, we've, as we've sent so many of our workers home, the, uh, they've, some of the struggles have been being able to uh, get onto the networks and the various companies and, and, and that. So uh, particularly in, uh, in Dakota County, we're somewhat unique, a tale of, of multiple counties in the fact that we have better broadband service in, in more the northern part of the county, but not perfect by any means. And then uh, in the southern part, there's been some real challenges in, in the more rural part of the county. And uh, it's certainly been something that all seven members of the county board have really focused on. Uh, we've created a Dakota broadband board made up of cities and, uh, and the county uh, looking at ways to try to improve, improve the, you know, and we've been doing this long before the last couple of weeks. It's been something of, of really trying to figure out that way to, to not only support our residents, but also our businesses uh, with a, with a better internet service on there. And, you know, on a short term with what we've been dealing in the last uh, number of weeks, um, some of our, our private providers are uh, doing, doing some of their part in uh, reducing their fees to offering free hotspots. And, and, and that makes a difference, but uh, you still go in many parts of the County and it's a, uh, it's pretty difficult to be able to go in and as we're looking at e-learning and, and and that it's actually been quite difficult to uh, to get through. So I think that we're making some steps and we were making some steps before all of this. Um, but I think that when 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 all this comes out, we're going to really realize that we need to do even more. Thank you. Agreed. Um, Christine, I'm going to turn to you next. Uh, I, the uh, there's been um, from a public health standpoint, there's now talk and, and some folks have commented about this shelter in place uh, and what that means. And does that mean that we would be, you know, literally have to stay in our home all day, every day uh, to the extent that that discussion has been happening in the public health community. Can you talk about what might be next if that order is given? Sure. Yes, we've heard uh, Governor Walt start talking about that could be one of the next stages that we would go to to try and help, again, prevent this virus from continuing to spread in our community and shelter in place is kind of exactly like you're describing where we're, we're really moving to a point of recommending no, um, you know, travel outside of your home unless it's for an essential service. So things like accessing healthcare, uh, food, um, things like that would still be in place. We've seen that happen in other countries around the world and now we're seeing it in a few of our states here in the US when other efforts to prevent the spread have not worked. And so what's happening in Minnesota is we're watching very carefully how the spread is um, going, what communities are we seeing it slow down in, in certain places. And so that's why we're at this really critical moment of trying to see if we can slow down that spread before going to that next level of containment of shelter in place. Okay. Here's another one. I think this is for you. If it's not, tell me. Um, but the question is what reforms or what changes would you recommend uh, in the future to avoid uh, this sort of thing from happening again? From a public health standpoint, is there are there ways that we can prevent this from occurring again? Well, certainly I think having a strong public health infrastructure is really important. Um, you can't train an epidemiologist in one week. It takes, you know, to, to have the infrastructure, and we're very fortunate here in Minnesota to have a, a very good public health infrastructure, but that's not the case necessarily around um, in other communities. And so that would be one thing I think we'll see is the, the importance of that. Um, I also think the importance of looking at our supply chain, particularly for our healthcare systems around vital capacity items um, will be very uh, evident after this, we get through this to be um, seeing the importance of knowing that we need to have supply chains kept open. Uh, what are we manufacturing here in the US? What's abroad? What can we make sure um, to prevent shortages? Thank you very much. I'm gonna turn at this point there's just a few minutes left we'll go back to congresswoman craig um kind of the the same sort of uh, of issues and then uh, congresswoman if you can uh, uh help us wrap up we've got about five minutes left but uh, 
some folks were already we got to get through this right and we're and we're going to and lots of folks are chipping in and, and pitching and do that uh, but how do we keep this from happening again uh, and then to the extent that you can have a message for volunteers um, and it uh, uh, you know ways that people can help perhaps uh, but then uh, kind of take us to uh, to a wrap up as well Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Atkins, and thank you for moderating. Uh, you've been a terrific moderator, uh, and uh, thank you for technology. I think every single one of us is uh, learning to adapt uh, to new technology, and from this end, this has worked great. Uh, what I will say is that we're never going to be able to prevent a public health issue or pandemic. What we can do, though, uh, is be ready when it does happen to uh, shift into gear. And so I, I think, you know, as we review the lessons uh, from uh, COVID-19, I think we're going to find, uh, and I have already started asking our county health officials in particular, um, you know, how prepared were you at the local level? And I think what you will find is for a number of years uh, at the federal level, uh, and we have uh, not funded preparedness activities consistently. Uh, we have left, uh, uh, continued to uh, reduce the amount of funding uh, for the CDC. The uh, most recent budget proposed by the administration proposed to cut the CDC by 40%. I think, you know, as you look at what's happening here, um, two years ago, the global health security team uh, that was responsible at a federal level for pandemics was disbanded. I think as we review what is happening here, we're gonna find that the level of preparedness was not sufficient uh, and that we're all gonna have to think deeply about the investment needed uh, once we get through this crisis to ensure that we're ready. Um, I think uh, the national stockpile, if you look at the numbers and how long the national stockpile will be prepared um, to provide resources to our healthcare workers, and our first responders was not adequate. And, you know, it, it's real tempting uh, right now to just say, um, you know, here's, here's what's going wrong and here's who should be blamed. And none of that is helpful at this moment in time. Right now, what is helpful is for the congressional delegation, uh, for Democrats, for Republicans, for everyone to come together with a singular focus. How can we best get through uh, the public health pandemic that the world is facing, not just the United States. And I do think as we look at supply chains, uh, particularly for healthcare, uh, that's something that we'll want to come back to as well. So Joe, if I, I, can, if I can for just a sure. moment, I just wanted to take a moment to commend uh, not just you, but our entire congressional delegation on a, on a bipartisan basis appears to have set aside all of the partisanship and are, are clearly working together uh, to try to deliver on this. So a quick thank you just from somebody that's been paying attention. Well, you know, we don't worry, we'll still argue over the details. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure but, you will. But at the end of the day, in a public health crisis, when, um, you know, this is really about the health and safety of Minnesotans, about putting people back to work as quickly as possible, we're all going to have to be willing to work together, but we're also going to have to be willing to compromise. Uh, I don't think that, uh, you know, compromise is a dirty word. Uh, I think there'll be some things in this next stimulus package that I would have put in, and there'll be some things that I would have uh, not liked. Uh, and at the end of the day, we're going to need to come together as a country and support it. So, um, you know, what, what really, Joe, has astounded me, and it's not surprising, but every single day that we're on the phone, that we're holding roundtables uh, with our community, that I'm talking to folks individually. Um, the biggest question I get is, how can I help? Uh, this is who Minnesota is. In some cases, uh, staying home, uh, staying safe is how you can help right now. In other cases, it's, um, you know, look to your local uh, community health center, your local food pantry, find out what they need. Uh, in other cases, it's check in on your neighbor, uh, particularly the elderly and most vulnerable among us. Uh, for some of you, you have technical expertise that you can offer uh, those of us who are not as expert in uh, how to do a great event like this. We've had to find those resources over the last several days. 
And at the end of the day, uh, there is no doubt in my mind that working together uh, in community, that we are going to be able to get through this. And just thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Mike, Christine, all of the counties in the second congressional district for being uh, so great at supporting our communities. And I would just end with this. Um, if there's anything you need from our office, if there's anything you need from me, we are uh, lines wide open. We're still working uh, across our communities to help our small businesses uh, on an individual basis, get access to the resources that they need to stay in business. Um, our One of our biggest calls in the last week was from worried parents trying to get young people home from wherever they are internationally. Um, keep those calls coming into our office. That is what we're here for. Um, and I just appreciate every single um, public official throughout the second congressional district for stepping up arm in arm, uh, no matter where you are politically, uh, to help our neighbor and to work together. So, Joe, again, thank you for moderating. You've been uh, an excellent moderator uh, this morning. Thank you very much. And with that, uh, thank you everyone for joining us this morning. Congresswoman, Chair Slavic, Christine Lees, uh, it's been great. For the support folks that have been running the questions into me and making me sound like I, uh, like I knew what I was doing. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Uh, I think this went well and we look forward to doing it again. With that, stay safe, wash your hands, and we'll look forward to uh, seeing you on the other side of this. Take care. Thank you.